Today we're going to talk about the energy of a rotating system. We've called this rotational energetics. Now remember, we just talked about kinematics and how we can study the angular velocity, if the velocity changes, how much time it takes. So we talked about omega and alpha and theta. And so we begin this series with a question kind of as a review over that. So here we have an angular flywheel. So a flywheel is simply a heavy disc and it's very important to the timing in your engine. But it's a heavy disc in the front of your car uh, that has some belts around it. And so it says the angular velocity of a flywheel starts at eight radians per second and it undergoes a constant angular acceleration of negative four radians per second squared. And it wants to know, what is the angular displacement when the flywheel reverses its direction? So first we wanna kind of label what we have and then look for what we're, what we're being asked to find. But notice immediately that you start off with a positive velocity and you have a negative acceleration. So this is a cue to us that this thing is going to slow down. So it's spinning, and of course, if it has a positive angular velocity, remember positive direction is going to be counterclockwise. So it's spinning counterclockwise, but it's going to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, stop, and then change its direction and speed up, speed up, speed up, if we keep that acceleration constant. So let's see. We know that we're looking for how far this goes, through how many radians does this travel. We do know that if we start at the beginning, we have a starting velocity of 8 radians per second, our final velocity will be zero. Our acceleration is negative four radians per second squared. Now this information does not give me anything about distance if I use the alpha equals change in omega over time equation, but I might be able to get time and then use another equation. So I might have to do this in two steps. So here I know that I can take that equation for um, change in omega over time is alpha, and rearrange it to solve for time. So I get time is change in omega over alpha. And then if I plug my information in, this gives me a time to, of, of two seconds. I still want to know how far this goes. So now I need to get into that long kinematic equation. I need to get into the theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. From here, the, the, the physics is kind of done. We just now plug in the math. So how far is this going to go? Well, it start at zero plus eight radians per second times two seconds, plus one half negative four radians per second squared times two seconds squared gives us a displacement of about eight radians. Eight radians, you remember 6.28 radians, that's two pi radians, that's one revolution. One time all the way around. So eight radians is about 1.3 revolutions. All right, so let's talk about rotational inertia. So remember, inertia in an object is very similar to its mass. If something has a lot of mass, we say it has a lot of inertia. Those things follow Newton's first law. Objects in motion want to stay in motion, and objects at rest want to stay at rest. The same is true for rotating systems. So we say rotating systems will have rotational inertia. But we do have an equation for this. Inertia, rotational inertia is the symbol I, I for inertia. And for a system of particles, for a bunch of little different points, like even if you took the solar system or something, and you considered each planet to be a point, um, it is the sum of mr squares. So it's a combination of the mass that you have and how far away you are from the radius, from the axis of rotation. So it's the sum of mr squares for a system of particles. So I is rotational inertia. It's measured in kilogram meters squared. That comes from, you know, mass in kilograms and r in meters. So I have several demonstrations that I want to show you today, but I'm going to move through these. Um, the first demonstration that I want to go through you, with you has to do with understanding the shape of an object and how that affects its rotational inertia. So this is a chart that shows different shapes and what axis they're spinning about because uh, the, your axis that you're spinning around can determine what your rotation is. For example, um, if you did a cartwheel, you know, you, you would rotate about an axis right through your belly button. And so you would have arms and legs around above the axis. But instead, if you did some Michael Jackson spin, you would be rotating about an axis right down through the top of your head where your mass is very close to this axis. So in those two cases, 
you have a different amount of rotational inertia based on that axis that you're going to spin around. I know that this looks kind of crazy, and in physics, I'm only going to ask you to know two equations. I'm going to ask you to always know um, the equation for a ring or hoop and the equation for a solid disk. So a solid disc rotating about its center has a rotational inertia of one half mR squared. Why one half? Well, remember, a solid disc has mass in the center and mass further out and mass further out. So we're looking at where is the average position of mass located. And then a hoop or a ring or a bicycle wheel is something that's going to have most of its mass all the way at the outside. So this equation is very similar to a system of particles. The, the inertia for a hoop or a ring is just mr squared. Knowing this, and then other scenarios, I will give you the rotational inertia for those things. But knowing this, we can take a look at some systems and say, okay, well, what if we had two objects that had about the same radius, slightly different masses, but they're different shapes? How does this affect um, their rotational inertia? And in turn, how does this affect kind of what it takes to, to change them and get them going? So I want to do a little demonstration with you guys and show you an example. So over here, we call this ramp races. So over here on the lab table, I have a ramp and I have a ramp jack and a bumper at the end of it. And I'm going to show you three masses. And over on the wall, I've written the rotational inertia for a disc, a ring, and a solid sphere. So here I have a solid disc um, and then I have a ring so it's got all the mass on the outside and finally I have a solid sphere. All of these have about the same out outer uh, diameter but what I want to do is I want to take them and put them on the track and just let them go and let them race down because we know that gravity is going to pull on all of them but because of their mass distribution it pulls on them and gets them to begin to rotate and some will want to rotate faster than others. So first we're going to take the disc and the ring. So the disc has a mass of 109 grams, the ring is only 91 grams. So a little bit less mass, a little bit more mass. And so I want you to make a prediction. Which one do you think is going to get to the bottom at the at, uh, first? So we'll put both of these up here. I'm going to use this little starting block here so I don't cheat so I can let them go at the same time. Okay, disc ring, disc ring. Which one you're gonna predict is gonna get there first? And now let's give it a try. Ready, three, two, one, go. Oh, not even close. The disc was clearly ahead of the ring. Why is this? Well, it has to do, their masses are not that different and the radius, the outer radius is the same, but remember, it's about mass distribution. How far away is that mass from the center? So the one that has the mass closer to the center is gonna have less inertia, which means it's easier to get it to accelerate. Let's take a look, since the disc won, let's try the disc versus the sphere, okay? So uh, remember now, the disc is 109 grams, the sphere is 117 grams, so these are even closer in mass. But the equation for rotational inertias are very different. The disc, one half mR squared, a solid sphere's inertia is two fifths mR squared. So I'd like for you once again to make a prediction which one's gonna get to the bottom first. So we have the disc and the sphere. Disc and the sphere. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Wow, that sphere gave that disc quite a run for its money. So it turns out that it's not just about the size of the object, but it's about that mass distribution that makes a difference in how the object is going to behave. So we'll come back around here and take a look at our notes again. I got you all crooked, sorry about that. So objects that have less rotational inertia are easier to get to rotate. So if they have their mass closer to the center of the axis of rotation, it's easier for them to spin or to change or accelerate. Let's take a look at our problem here. So we have a two kilogram mass and a three kilogram mass. 
are mounted on opposite ends of a two meter long rod that has negligible mass. So we're really only looking at this blob and this blob, okay? And they say, what is the rotational inertia about the center of the rod? So how much inertia right there at the center um, and about each mass, assuming that the axes of rotation are perpendicular to the rod. So we're looking for the rotational inertia of this as a system. Now remember, our rod is two meters long. So if we're looking for um, the inertia right about here at the center, these are spinning around. Now it's gonna kind of wobble, right? But we're looking for the inertia at that point. So if the origin is the center of rod, we know that I is the sum of MR squared. So we want each mass and its radius squared. If I have a two meter rod, each mass is about one meter from the center, right? So it's gonna be mass one times radius squared, mass two times the radius squared. I'm gonna add these together to get the total rotational inertia. So two kilograms times one meter squared plus three kilograms times one meter squared turns out to be five kilogram meters squared. Not too bad. Next, we want to talk a little bit about, we've talked about mass, we've talked about velocity, angular velocity. We want to talk a little bit about kinetic energy. Objects that are moving in a straight line have linear kinetic energy. We know that we calculated that as one half mass times velocity squared. Well, we can also call that translational kinetic energy. So if a bike is going down the road, it's translating, it's moving in a straight line. But objects that are rotating have rotational kinetic energy squared. And that rotational kinetic energy is also similar. One half, not mass, but mass distribution. So rotational inertia, I. And not velocity squared, but rotational velocity or angular velocity, which is omega. So the rotational kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. Now, it is possible for an object to be having to have both kinds of kinetic energy at the same time. If you're riding a bicycle, um, you have linear kinetic energy and the wheels are rotating, so they have angular kinetic energy. And all of that energy is gonna be conserved. And this is very much why somebody who's riding a bike, if the front wheel comes to rest really quickly because they hit a tree stump or something, the wheels stop rotating, but that energy is then transferred to the rider and the rider will then begin to rotate and they go over the handlebars into a crash. So the total kinetic energy is gonna be a combination of one half mv squared and one half i omega squared. As we run your mousetrap cars down the hallway, we're gonna find that this is true as well. And we're gonna figure out what is their linear kinetic energy, what is their rotational kinetic energy, and what is the total kinetic energy. So let's take a look at this problem. A three meter rod has a one kilogram mass attached to one end and a one and a half kilogram mass attached to the other end. If the rod is spinning at 20 RPMs, that's rotations per minute, also not the unit that we want, but um, if it's spinning at its midpoint around an axis perpendicular to the rod, what is the resulting rotational kinetic energy ignoring the mass of the rod? So once again, we have two particles rotating around this center, and we wanna know what is the rotational kinetic energy, all right? So to get that, remember we have our origin at the center of the rod. So the inertia, because if rotational kinetic energy is one half I omega squared, the inertia is the sum of MR squares. So we're gonna have mass one times radius one squared plus mass two times radius two squared. So the inertia I will be one times 1.5 squared plus 1.5 times 1.5 squared, which gives us a total inertia of 5.63 kilogram meters squared. Now, that's the inertia. We need to multiply that by omega. Remember, omega now is in 20 RPMs. We have to convert that omega to radians per second. So when we do, the kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. Once you convert 20 rotations per minute to radians per second, Remember that one rotation is 6.28 radians, and of course, 60 seconds in a minute. So we'll come up with 2.09 radians per second for 20 rotations per minute. So you get one half times 5.63 times 2.09 radians per second, and you square that, and you get a total kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy of 12.3 joules. So let's take a look at one more problem. 
Here it says we have a solid ball that has a mass of 300 grams and a diameter of 80 centimeters. Careful with that, right? It is thrown at 28 meters per second. As it travels through the air, it also spins with an angular speed of 110 radians per second. So that's omega. The rotational inertia of a solid sphere is two-fifths mr squared. So remember, this is a solid sphere. I told you I would give you that inertia. What is its translational kinetic energy, its rotational kinetic energy, and its total kinetic energy? So look at it as translational kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So one-half times 0.3, right? Got to convert grams to kilograms, times the velocity, 28 meters per second squared, 118 joules. Okay, so rotational kinetic energy is one-half I omega squared. So one-half times two-fifths times mass times R squared times omega squared. Whoo, lots of these, right? Well, one-half times two-fifths is two-tenths. So then we have to reduce that to one-fifth. And then MR squared mass times, oh, look what we did to the, to the uh, radius. So if we knew that the diameter was 80 centimeters, then the radius is 40 centimeters, we had to convert to meters, right? So that's 0.4 meters squared. And then we had to convert, or we were given the angular velocity, 110 radians per second. And we square that, we come up with 117 joules. Now, please note, this is random that that happened, that the kinetic energy linear and the rotational kinetic energy were about the same. That's seldom the case but this just worked out this way in this problem. Okay, so now they want the total kinetic energy. We're simply gonna add those two things together. We get 235 joules. Okay. All right, that's it for today.